everyone. So, as you know, today's topic is uh, meeting Buddhism, Buddhism and its teachings on religious harmony. Actually, it's a very important and also a very, uh, a very controversial matter around the world, especially in, in some parts of the world. So, in this talk, uh, I, divide, I will divide it into two sessions. The first session will focus on the uh, some of the core subjects of Buddhism. In the second session, we will talk about the Buddhist teachings on religious harmony or coexistence. So without wasting time, uh, I shall directly go to the main talk. In the first session, I will talk about four categories that are very important in Buddhism. They are, actually they are known as the triple refuges or the triple gems and they are the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha. I put the Dhamma at last because uh, like in other religions, uh, Dhamma is the teachings of the Buddha. That means what he taught for the 45 years. So 45 years is a quite long time. He has taught every day. He, he has met people every day. So all these things are recorded as Dhamma. And under the Dhamma, I will discuss four important subjects. So let's get, get back to the past topic. There's the double uh, there. Actually, when you see the world religions, whether ancient, in ancient time or at present, you find some kind of divinity or you find the founders are related to divinity or they are messengers or they are gods. But in Buddhism, the Buddha has never claimed to be a, a god or a divine messenger or he is not related to any divinity and he always clarified to the people that he is not so and also during his time there were people who heard, who wrongly heard that he is a god he is a Mahabrahma Mahabrahma is the, <coughs> the the almighty god of Brahmanism and people also heard that he is, the, he is always omniscient, that means that he is always fully aware of what's happening in the, in the world, in the universe, and in other, other worlds. But the Buddha says he is not. And according to Buddha, and as what we see in the history of Buddhism, and also in his life records. He was born as a human and lived as a human and passed away as a human. He was born as a prince but he left the palace to in search of eternal happiness and he after attaining enlightenment he preached for 45 years and he guided people he worked for the social development and he passed away as a human being. But the difference is he, he is not just an ordinary human being. He was enlightened and he guided people and he because of his spiritual attainments he is a supramundane being among all human beings. So now you can see, although you see the Buddha is a human being, but you can see here there's a huge difference between the Buddha and the normal human beings like us. And also, when you when you compare him with his uh, enlightened disciples, in, in Theravada Buddhism we call the the arhans. Arhans are the enlightened disciples in Theravada Buddhism. They are also not equal to Buddhism. They, they, sorry, not equal to the Buddha. The Buddha surpassed 
everyone, physically as well as spiritually, that means intellectually. In one of the discourses in the Pali canon, there's the canon of the Theravada tradition, uh, <coughs> there are 32 characteristics that this course mentioned about 32 characteristics of a great being. Just according to the Brahmanic literature, uh, they believe that this, the individual who possess these characteristics, the great 32 characteristics, he would either become a will rolling monarch, that means a righteous <coughs> king, or he would become a Buddha. And also, when when you say he suffers the the normal human beings, he actually is not that he is not related to him human human society. He is actually related to human society, but the, the only thing as I earlier said, he was superior intellectually. Now there are evidences uh, that many of the followers of other religions have uh, have heard that Buddha is so and so and sometimes they try to debate with the Buddha sometimes they try to argue with the Buddha but uh, the Buddha was always open to all he was friendly and he clarified in one incident the a Brahmin named Vachagutta and he came to the Buddha and he says uh, I have heard about you that you are an omniscient person but the Buddha said I am not so and the Buddha tells him that you have wrongly heard and it's an open statement and the Buddha tells that if he is omniscient he cannot even walk because when he walks he will see all the things happening in the world and he cannot concentrate on his walking. And also, if he is omniscient, he, he cannot live a normal life in the human society. But he was living in a human society. That's why he says he is not a divine being or a god or a messenger from the heaven or he is he's not a an almighty, a creator. He's just a human being who has uh, who has practiced and gone through lots of, of hardships and he learned from many teachers and ultimately he also strived himself and he is enlightened. <coughs> Actually when you say the Buddha as a human being in one way, you can say it's correct. Now, when we say he lived as a he, he was born as a human, lived as a human, and passed away as a human, it's true actually. It's not it's, it's not a wrong or it's not an open statement. Here, in one discourse, one of his disciples, also the chief attendant, the venerable Ananda, he notices and tells that the that the Buddha, Buddha is getting old and his, his skin was soft when he was young and now he is, he is bending forward it's like the, when you get older you bend forward and he's, he's wearing away you, you see the human qualities in him And also, when when he tells people about these overstatements and this this wrong understanding about him, uh, the Buddha tells them not to believe on hearsay or just because things are written on text or just because their teachers tell them or just because their masters tell them or just because their parents tell them or just because their religious teachers tell them, or just because their relatives or close friends tell them. The Buddha say to inquire, examine, verify. And then only 
you accept the right thing. <coughs> now, otherwise, it will be like if you, if you just uh, hear from somebody and believe it, it it's like going, going to be like what the Brahmin what's about the heart. And actually, this is also where Buddhism differ from other religions in the conversion. Buddhism gives you the freedom to think and question. Now, Buddha also tells people to question him, question his knowledge. And when, when people question, the Buddha clarifies truthfully. Clarifies what is what is what is the truth about him. In other words, uh, we find the Buddha traveling from human world to heavenly worlds. Now, this doesn't mean that Buddha is again related to divinity. Now, I think in we believe in hell and heaven and. This is, this is not something that related to creation theory or extreme divinity, but it's uh, just to guide the heavenly beings in those in those heavenly worlds. And also, when when he returns, he is again a, a human being with higher knowledges. And in one of the the epithets of the Buddha, he is known as known <coughs> with the nine qualities because of his the his intellectual and his his practices and the way he guides people. And as you can see here, uh, we have the nine ep ep uh, qualities in the epithets. So he is known as a worthy one and an, a fully enlightened one and one who is endowed with knowledge and conduct. And also he is well known one, knower of the world, incomparable charity of any beings, the teacher of gods and men, one who makes others understand, and the blessed one. Here, I would like to explain one of the qualities here. When you say one who is endowed with knowledge and conduct, what do you mean by that? That means, uh, he is endowed with knowledge and he preaches what he practiced, what, what is reality. He is not practicing something metaphysics or he is not something, something that, is, that is, he is not teaching something that is uh, mystifying or mysterious. He is teaching something that he is, uh, that we can practice here and now in this world. And here, knower of the world does not also mean that he knows everything in the world. We don't have such a person in the world. He, what, what he means by this is that he knows what is needed to end the human suffering in the world. So then let's get back to another topic. That's the sum up because we are running out of the time. When the Buddha attained enlightenment, he was alone didn't have any community or institutions but if you want to do something if you want to to express what you believe you need community you need institutions so that they can assist you to express your message your teachings and your practices what you believe so here after the Buddha attained enlightenment, he went to his former colleagues and then he preached them and they, they became his disciples. And later, another 
55 more people got disciples under him, and the Buddha directed them to travel to different directions and spread the Dharma for all beings. Now, these disciples are called the community of community of monks and nuns. In general, actually, they are called like. But in a very wider aspect, when we say sangha, actually, it includes not only monks and nuns. It also includes monks, nuns, and lay male followers, and also female lay followers. So now. Another aspect of Buddhism here, you can see, Buddhism includes everyone in the society, regardless of their religion, their uh, genders, and their class or professions or social classes. Buddhism accepts all. So, and what is the role of the Sangha? One of the most important roles is the one of the preliminary roles that the Sangha has to bear up is <coughs> their the, the their aims to live the spiritual life. And the purpose of their the, the fundamental one of the fundamental purpose of their life is to live the spiritual life. And, uh, unlike the uh, the normal life, where like uh, where we have the very busy life, the spiritual life leads you to eternal happiness. So, the purpose, the fundamental purpose of a monk is to lead himself to his direction, and later guide the society to the same direction for better happiness. And another duty of the monks is to preserve the Buddha's teachings and also hand over them to the next generation for the all welfare <coughs> and happiness of all beings. And let's go to the next topic. That is the Dhamma, the most important topic of today's talk. And under this topic, I will talk about four subjects. They are the four noble truths, the theory of dependent coordination, and the three universal characteristics, and the noble eightfold path. Now. Before going to the the these four, four topics in detail, now let me talk about the about Dharma in general. Although the four subjects, especially the four truths, talk mostly about suffering, one should not think that Buddhism sees life as suffering. Actually. Buddhism is neither pessimistic nor optimistic. What Buddhism talk is realistic. And Buddhism does not see, does not always see life as suffering. Buddhism takes a realistic view of life and the world. It looks at things as they are and objectively. And it does neither falsely tell you about a heavenly world or nor agonize you about health. It explains exactly and object objectively what we and what the world around us is and shows us the way to perfect freedom peace, tranquility, and happiness. And when talking about suffering in Buddhism, uh, we should not also always think that 
Buddhism does not emphasize happiness in life. Actually, Buddhism emphasizes happiness in life. Now, for example, one, one of the most important teaching on Buddhism is to, to find eternal happiness. Besides that, Buddhism also divides happiness into different levels. What, what, what Buddhism emphasizes is to find or look for happiness that is long-lasting and eternal. And that happiness should be gained through moral means. Not, not through moral means. What Buddhism does is, Buddhism puts eternal happiness in the highest level. Now, in case of only happiness, they are always changing. And when, when something changes, you feel the pain. You, you, feel, you feel unsatisfied. So it creates, it, it creates sorrowfulness and it makes you unhappy. So that's why Buddhism emphasizes that you look for a common happiness, that is the spiritual happiness. <coughs> Now let's go to the the one of the core subjects, core topics of Buddhist teachings. Actually, this is also known as the heart of the Buddhist teachings. That is, the four noble truths. So, the four noble truths are the noble truth of suffering, the noble truth of arising of suffering and the noble truth of cessation of suffering. The last one is the four noble truth of the path leading to the cessation of suffering. So what is the noble truth of suffering? The Buddha divides the first noble truth into three aspects. That is, suffering as ordinary suffering, suffering produced by change, and suffering as condition instead. Now, what is suffering as ordinary suffering? It is the sufferings like but old age, sickness, death, association with unpleasant persons, separation from beloved ones, and but separation from, from pleasant conditions, not getting what one wants, grief, lamentation, distress, all such forms comes under suffering as ordinary suffering. So, and suffering produced by change is the sadness and unsatisfactoriness that you get from the changing, the change to the, the things that are subject to change. change. Now, for example, a happy feeling, a happy condition in life is not permanent nor everlasting. It ch changes sooner or later. When it changes, it produces pain, suffering, and unhappiness. This vicissitude is included in this aspect of suffering produced by change. And in the last one, there is suffering as condition state. Actually, this aspect is the most philosophical and complicated aspect uh, in the in the first truth, in the first of the four noble truths. So, what is suffering as condition state? This is actually. What we call a being, to what, what we call a being, is actually not a being. Now, say for example, me, I call myself Jian Nanda, mm -hmm. but am I truly Jian Nanda? Mm -hmm. <coughs> actually, in the ultimate sense. I'm, I'm not Jian Nanda. It, it's, it's just a designation. I'm just given a name. I was born and my parents gave me a name. Or when I was getting old in, 
my spiritual master gave me the name. But what what am I truly? The the true picture of me is the combination of five aggregates. So they are uh, form, feeling, sensation, conditioning forces, and consciousness. Unfortunately, we don't we don't consider this reality. We don't we don't want want to accept the reality that we are the combination of several parts of elements and when when this changes we feel that sadness we, f we feel that unhappiness we feel suffering so this state of suffering is called the suffering as condition state now let's go to see what is the rising of suffering Actually, the, the, the sufferings, the sadness, and sorrow, unsatisfactoriness that's pre prevalent in ancient time, or even at present, is the cause of craving. We always crave for things. We always crave for new things. We always crave for more good things. Now, if you say in Hong Kong, you you want you you crave for a bigger house. <laughs> but <laughs> if you if, if you if you don't have enough money, you can't get a bigger house. And what happens? You are sad. You are not satisfied with your life. It's, uh, your life seems to be un unfulfilled. So this is actually for craving. We crave for more. We are never satisfied, and this creates sadness in our life. And what's the cause of craving? In Buddhism, uh, we we provide three root causes again. That is the greed, hatred, and delusion. And what's the cause of these three three factors? These three fires. The main cause of these three fires is ignorance. Because we are ignorance, we don't accept uh, the reality in life. We don't. We we don't accept that because I don't have money, I can't buy a big house. But still, we we want a big house. Then our life is in the pool of suffering. In that case, we we we. We are never happy. In our whole life, we are never happy. We think that our life is not full. Our our life is not fulfilled. It's un unfulfilled. We 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 live a we we live a life where we cannot fulfill our dreams. We cannot make our dreams come true. So this creates lots of trouble in life. Life, and this does not condition only to yourself but also to your family that's why the Buddha teaches that we have to learn to be satisfied we have to learn to let go our craving let go our desires to be satisfied with what we have and if you look around actually we are much better off than many many people in the world. We have so many things that other people don't have. So we are much better, we have a better life. So why why be sad and un unhappy? Why be unsatisfied? And so now we know that what's the cause of the rising of suffering? What's the cause that leads to the rise of suffering? And let's, let's, let's go to the <coughs> next it is the third truth. Here, 
the third truth helps you to seize a way suffering. That is, uh, now you know what is suffering, and you know what is the cause of suffering. And next, you have to find how you can overcome suffering. And what is suffering? What what are the way? And, and what is the 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 stage where you don't have you, you don't have this unsatisfactoriness? You don't find these these factors these these negative factors in life. And there is the cessation of suffering is the extinction of craving. The extinction of three fires, that is greed, hatred, and delusion, and the attainment of nibbana, that is the ultimate liberation of the Buddhist. And also, to attain this stage, you have a, you have to have a way, you have to have a method, and you have to have a path. Just like if you want to reach to another place, you have to have a way to, to reach that place. And what, what is the path that is? The four truth, that is the, the path leading to the cessation of suffering. And there is none other than the Noble Eightfold Path. And because I'm going to explain it later, I will not talk about it now. So we'll go to the next, another topic, that is, the theory of dependent coordination. Actually, during the Buddha's time, there were many religions, and also there were philosophers who were looking for ways to find happiness, to find eternal happiness, to find everlasting happiness. Like, like we are facing just like we are facing lots of problems in that during that time also they had lots of problems so they were looking for happiness and many of the religious groups they presented several theories several methods but unfortunately the the, the methods were not enough to reach this a stage of the, the the level of this eternal happiness and as a response to these theories, the theories of how the world is functioning, how life functions, how the cycle of life functions, the Buddha presented the theory of dependent coordination. And what 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 is the this theory? What 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 does it tell us? According to this theory, everything in the universe or within an individual actually they function interdependently. Now for example say in my case I'm Jananda and I'm a human being. But I am also a combination of five aggregates which I mentioned earlier. Now say, you take out consciousness, the last aggregates. Will you find me? Now what will happen if you take out consciousness? I will be just like that log, and that tree. So, now you see, things are dependently in interdependently existing. There is no uh, final final crea crea creator of things, no no God that creates us. Now if you if you say how how we come to this world, how did we come to this world? Some, some might say 
some uh, some divine being created me, or some might say the Almighty created me. Actually, it's not so. Buddhism does not believe so because Buddhism does not believe in such a theory. According to Buddhism, if you if you ask me how you came to world, how you came to the world, <coughs> it is, the answer is simple. I I I I I am born, and you know the process of human birth, and so it's it, it's that simple. And here we don't need the the creation theory, a, a creator, and therefore with this theory, Buddhism also explains other problems. Now say the problem of this unsatisfactory and the problem of suffering. Now, how suffering comes? Now, earlier I was explaining what is the cause of suffering? Craving. According to this theory of dependent coordination, now if you see, well, now, if you see the slide, you, you, you can see when there is craving, there is unsatisfactoriness. It's true, right? you don't have a house and we have that for a whole life. And with the arising of craving, unsatisfactoriness arises. With your with the arising of your desire to have something, remember suffering is also accompanying your desire. So that means with the arising of craving, suffering also arises. How? If you don't if you don't get what you want <laughs> you will definitely be sad and also sometimes you might get it but after you get it you will see some changes if you buy a house you can buy a house but the house is also subject to change gradually right so when the house is normal there you feel sad when something is broken in the house you feel sad so with one thing so many things are coming then so this theory also explains how suffering can be ceased. That is, when craving is not there, there is no unsatisfactoriness. With the cessation of craving, unsatisfactoriness ceases. With these explanations, the Buddha also explains the cycle of human birth and death. In Buddhism, I think many of you might know, in Buddhism we also believe in karma. That is, uh, <coughs> karma doesn't mean every action that you do. It means, karma means, the you find karma in pragmatism also, but it's not the same as what we have in Buddhism. Karma is what we do intentionally. So, if you do good karma, sometimes you might have a better results a bit later or even even later. Also, because we believe in karma, we also believe in rebirth. And with this theory of dependent coordination, Buddhism also explains that your are uh, not the this is not your first birth. There might be several of your previous births and also you might be reborn in future after after your death. After after you pass I mean. So Buddhism explains how this function, this cycle functions with this theory of different. Now as you can see, actually although I number them, in the true sense, actually, there is no beginning. As you see the circle with arrows, there is no beginning. Here, the <coughs> 12 limbs of the theory of dependent coordination also explains how one give rise to 
happiness or gives rise to unhappiness in life, they are all interdependent upon each other. Now, ignorance gives rise to these conditioning forces, and conditioning forces give rise to the consciousness. And then you imagine something, you 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 inform the the physical aspect of what, what you want. And then you get slowly you get one by one, one by one, then ultimately either it creates suffering or it creates happy, uh, happiness. And next go to the another topic. And this is the the three universal characteristics. This is also related to the, the first topic that we talked about, is the Four Noble Truths. And this, the, the three universal characteristics are change or impermanence, suffering or unsatisfactoriness, no self or soullessness. Actually, to understand Buddhism and also to see the uniqueness of Buddhism among other religions, you need to understand these three factors. And you can see the difference between Buddhism and other religions. So, the first one explains about change or impermanence. I think it's clear to everyone. Everything is subject to change. Now, say, see the process of a, of a human being. He is born and slowly he grows up, and then he grows up to be an adult, and, a, and a, say, a man or a woman, <coughs> and he grows old and then pass away. Not only a human being, but also everything in the world it keeps changing <clears throat> actually we might feel <coughs> sad and unsatisfied and also unhappy but actually this is the reality you you might go to a doctor and try to be fit always, but one day still you will face the reality. So this, the first characteristic explains that. Then the second one is, you, you, you know already, because of this changing, this impermanency, suffering arises in you. Why? Because you, you don't want to accept the reality. And then it, give, it gives rise to suffering or unsatisfactoriness. Then let's go to the third characteristics that is actually very important because in the Indian religions you don't find these characteristics in any religion. You find it only in Buddhism. And this is also one of the very complicated subjects in Buddhism. There is a, you might remember I was talking about the, the human being and what is the, the, how is a human being made, how an individual is made up of. The indi an individual, a human being is made up of five aggregates form, feeling, sensation, and con uh, conditioning forces and consciousness. So these characteristics explains that there is no permanent self in us. There is no soul in us. To, be to explain this in a better way, now we always are claiming ownership. This is my computer, this is my water bottle, this is my house, and this is my body, this is my 
my my ear and this is my hand and we are always claiming of ownership and when we say I am this is mine this is mine we should have the power to control ourselves <coughs> unfortunately we don't have that well nobody wants to get old nobody wants to get sick nobody wants to suffer but can we can we control can we obstruct the process of getting old older can you obstruct the process of getting sick we might go to a doctor it, it might work for some time after getting medication but ultimately still we face the same thing which, which changes things things keep changing so these characteristics explain that that actually although we say my my i an individual in the ultimate sense actually it is not so now we have a very interesting dialogue between the buddha and a brahmin and, 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 and wanderer a wanderer during the buddha's time so now as you can see the this brahmin called satchaka came to the buddha and he claims this such, such he claims the buddha such kinds of things this the permanency of things the eternity of things and the buddha as usual with a very friendly way he asks this brahmin so he asks is form permanent or impermanent and this brahmin also nicely answers indeed go to my impermanent then the buddha again goes to us whatever is impermanent is unsatisfactoriness or happiness and he such a replies indeed go to my is unsatisfactoriness and the Buddha asks him again, indeed, whatever is impermanent, unsatisfactoriness, changing, it is suitable to see completely as this is mine, or this is me, or this is this soul is mine. Satchaka goes to reply, it is not so. A very nice process. This is very logical and it's real. We, we might have an, have an iPhone and claim that this is mine. <coughs> but the iPhone gets older, gets old, and from new to it becomes old, and one day it, it gets dam damaged. And at that time, we suffer, we miss something. So, these three, three characteristics explain. The process of life, how do you function? And if, if we can accept the reality, so we 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 can escape from suffering. The next, let's go to the, the last topic of the first session. This is the four other truths. Earlier in the first topic, okay, we I, I mentioned that the path leading to the cessation of suffering is the eightfold path. So what are the eightfold path? There, right understanding or right view, right thought or right speech, right action, right good, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. So let's see what right these these uh, four four truth no, sorry the, these eight factors. What are these eight factors? Actually, this path is presented against the Buddhist practices of. Buddhist practices prevalent during the Buddha's time. However, these practices also can be practiced even today and even in future. These eight factors uh, 
concerns the three aspects of uh, human development that is the morality and also the development of our mind and the existence of that stage. And so here we have morality, concentration, wisdom, and you can see the division. Uh, what is morality? It is right speech, right action, and right livelihood. And what is uh, concentration or the good for is it is right effort and right mindfulness and right concentration. And wisdom is right understanding and right judgment. So what are these? Let's check. <coughs> Right view or right understanding is the right view of four truths. That is, the understanding of the four truths. The understanding or the the right view of the knowledge of the functional karma. We should accept what is wholesome and unwholesome, what is right and what is wrong. And what is right thought? That is right renunciation here renunciation does not mean you have to leave your home go to the jungle <coughs> and meditate you let go craving this should be number one in your list of letting go yeah, that's what it's meant by renunciation and thought of non cruelty and the thought of non ill will. And right speech is refrain from falsehood, it is false talk. And refrain from harsh speech, refrain from slandering, refrain from ideal talk. And what is right action? Refrain from killing, refraining from stealing, refraining from misconduct. And the fifth one. Right livelihood means refraining from five businesses. Business in beings, as you see today, uh, people people are doing business even uh, in slavery. That's a that's a very bad thing. It it leads the society to downfall. And in weapons, you see war happening these days. And intoxication. When you take too much of uh, intoxicated drinks, you get addicted and your mind cannot function in the normal level. So it leads you to to down level of, the, of development. And in the business of poison, poison is dangerous, it kills. And business in flesh. The sixth one is right effort. So what is right effort? That is, one makes effort to arise the wholesome states that are not erosion. One makes effort to increase the wholesome states that are erosion. One makes effort to give up unwholesome states that are erosion. One makes effort to prevent the unwholesome states that are not erosion. So you should, you should make an effort to keep you good thought with you and you should not make any effort to give rise to unwholesome thought of unwholesome action. It is the intention of evil thoughts, evil, evil actions. And the sixth one is right concentration. That is, you should have mindfulness in mindfulness of your body, mindfulness of your feeling and mindfulness of your mind and mindfulness of things around you. You should be always mindful. Then the last one, the Sama Samadhi, that is right concentration. This is actually the the attainments of the higher attainments in Buddhism, the spiritual attainments. But this does not mean that this is not for the lay society, the lay people. The eight, the noble eightfold part, or these eight factors, are suitable for everyone. They are suitable for spiritual development, 
as well as uh, suitable for social development. So they function in both aspects equally. And as you can see, these eight factors never falls in the extremes. They neither harm you nor others. So this is definitely something that we need. <coughs> this is definitely something that the world needs. And because we because of this these things are not embraced, now people act in negatively and there are lots of things, uh, negative things are happening in the world. And as you can see, the some some people want to enjoy, extremely enjoy the material world, and some people uh, they go to the extreme religious practices. But the Buddha presents the Golden Eight Pole but that neither goes to that extreme enjoyment of materialism and also the extreme religious practices. So in in other words actually the Buddha presented the theory of dependent coordination in a, against the the their, their theories of dif different practices, different opinions, and the Buddha presented the Noble Eightfold Path against their practices of these extreme religious practices, and also the theory of extreme material enjoyment. And that's the end of the constitution of my talk. Thank you. Thank you, Venerable Member. Now, uh, do you accept some questions? Uh, I you think uh, I'll not take any snacks or I think you're sub serving snacks, or, right? So yeah. while you uh, I can, I can enjoy your snacks, <laughs> <laughs> so I think you can... A couple of questions that we can, we can have. Yeah. Uh, um, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, it was really <coughs> interesting. Um, w during your talk, you mentioned the five aggregates that human beings are made of, right? It's a form, consciousness, sensation, uh, feeling... Form, feeling of volition, volition uh, sensation, conditioning forces, and consciousness. Uh -huh. I, was, I was interested, could you please more explain the difference between the sensation and feeling? As I'm, I'm not sure how I see the difference. I just wanted to make, make understand what is the Buddhist point of view. Now, feeling is what you feel, uh -huh. right? Okay. It's, it's, it's that simple. But is not sensation also about senses and about feeling? But th there's th there's a difference between feeling and sensing. You sense through your con uh, sense basis. Oh, I see. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you so much. Are now, the, are the, the, are the sensations arising from contact between yeah. the sense organ and the sense object? Okay, and the feeling? And then it, it, then it, then it will lead into the, uh, into the mental constructs, because then you will have either, oh, I really want that, or, oh, I don't want okay. it, yeah. okay. or I have no feeling whatsoever. Okay. Based on conditioning factors, because previously, Previously, you may have eaten a tomato and it didn't taste well, so every time you see a tomato, you don't want to touch it. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yes, please. Well, so, um, I don't know if you're familiar with Abraham Maslow. He's an American psychologist. Uh, I was just reading some of his stuff recently. Um, he has one of his uh, bodies of work is around theories of motivation. Um, and so I'm, you know, I'm kind of interested in. Um, this in conjunction with this 
this uh, Buddhist theory of craving as being um, a source of suffering. You know, I mean, craving, you gave the example of wanting to buy a house but not having the money. You can see how that would create suffering. Um, and, but I, I wonder what, you know, how the, what the you know, like you say a Buddhist position um, with regards to you know, something that may be a little bit toned down, like desire, right? Yeah, yeah. Which is natural, which is, um, you know, necessary for life in lots of different ways. Um, so, you know, when does desire become craving? And is desire itself, um, again, Buddhist position, just kind of a necessary part of life that is does not necessarily contribute to suffering, but then there's some kind of line, right, where, where it starts to become, uh, it starts to contribute to, to suffering. Yeah. Now, when we talk about desire and craving, uh, we, 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 I think uh, it's much better if we put it in the wants and needs in life. And you clearly know that needs are the things that we need to survive. And once other things, there's ex the extra things you want in life. Now, if I have a small house, and still you you want a bigger house, but you already have the shelter to live, <coughs> and you will not your life will not perish if you don't have a bigger house. So now you can see the difference between needs and wants. So desire is something that, something like wants. So it definitely, also actually, it depends on positive desires and negative desires. If, 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 it, if you, if you desire to help people, that's a good thing, right? And if you want to help people, you don't necessarily need so many. Even you can, you can help people without having money or a house. Or you can help with what you have. It, it depends on so many things. Now, if you unnecessarily want to have something, if you unnecessarily want to desire for something, crave for something, and you, you cannot have it, but this definitely will give rise to unsatisfactoriness. It will make your life sad. So when we talk about craving, also we have to see the needs and wants. And the Buddha, when he, he, he was forming the Sangha, the community of monks, he he gives the utmost needy things, he prescribes the utmost needy things for the monks living. Monks could live without a big house. At that time, uh, usually these ascetics and brahmins, the religious uh, people, they usually didn't live in palaces or big houses. They either had a small hut or they lived under trees, at the foot of trees, or inside the caves. So they were okay, and they need food. So now we have uh, shelter to live under and food and something to wear. People come from <coughs> without clothes, so something to wear, right? And they, they, they need other utensils also. So when you see a man's life, actually, the Say the, the uh, Buddhist man's life. It actually the Buddha actually described the things that the monks needed to live. In practicing the Buddhist practice, aiming to attain spiritual happiness, the the Buddha never prescribed and um, uh, emphasized a monk to have a blood cut. They were Usually people were traveling by blood cards blood at the time, or postcards. So 
the Buddha didn't describe that they were walking. They to go to another place walking. But at present, the the things have changed. So if you, if you want to definitely go to another country, you need to buy a ticket, get a ticket. And that's a needy thing. You can say a needy thing. That's a needy thing. OK, one more last question. Yes, please. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I want you to like a little bit explain more about the Buddha's future. Now, you mentioned that like it says the teacher of gods and men. Yeah. yeah. Can you explain a little bit more about that part? Yeah. And now the, OK, the second question is, uh, only one question. <laughs> <laughs> only one, but this is this is much interesting. Okay. Like whenever whenever I see a Buddhist, yeah. uh, like the dress that they wear is much uh, much likely between the range of brown and orange. Is there any special? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You yeah, know. So is there any special reason for that? Actually, it differs in in many regions. It differs uh, in the. The groups they belong to in, in Buddhism in Buddhist community Buddhist all that we also have groups. Okay. So it differs. Now, for example, it seems in Thailand they have two major groups. One would wear the this color, the other one would wear this color. Two different. But uh, sometimes the some monks prefer their own color. Now I I prefer this and this, but. When I was coming, I, I happened to <laughs> have this color. Mm -hmm. And also, sometimes you might, you you may have seen either in movies or around somewhere else, uh, some monks are wearing <coughs> long dresses, mm -hmm. uh, long dresses, uh, and some and we are wearing some kind of cloth. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, in that case, it differs in tradition in. in in Buddhism also, we have three major Buddhist traditions. There's, I belong to the Theravada tradition, Thasak also, and there's also the tradition of the Mahayana, I think you see around here, and also you might have seen some Kung Fu movies. Yeah. You see the monks flying. <laughs> yeah. So they are, they, 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 those are called the Mahayana, they represent the Mahayana tradition, and you might have seen Dalai Lama, he belongs to the Vajrayana tradition. Now you see the clothing, <coughs> the difference between the clothing. <coughs> Actually, they, they evolve as the, the, the Buddhist Sangha has spread all in, in different parts of the world. And they took up different traditions. And different sects and groups took up different traditions, different ways. But when you say their yeah, aim is actually one aim, to end suffering is to attain eternal happiness. That is in the, the ultimate liberation in Buddhism, Nibbana, or Nirvana. Thank you.